If you please stand with us this morning and worship. I'll tell you what, before we do, let's pray. Lord, help us today as we focus on you, not only in song, but as we look into your word. Lord, bless every student, Lord, from our nursery all the way up, Lord. As we study your word today, Lord, to help us to learn from you. Help us to worship you. Help us to praise your name, for you are worthy of our praise. In the precious and powerful name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Thanks to the Lord and proclaim his greatness. Let the whole world know what he has done. Sing to him, yes, sing his praises. Tell everyone about his wonderful deeds.
Loving the world, hating the dark. Psalms 1828 says, you, are the, you light a lamp for me. The Lord, my God, lights up my darkness. Um, throughout the song, it's just talking about how great God is. And I didn't notice it till just now singing. But the last two songs have been talking about God being our light. And, I mean, where would we be without light? We'd be walking around in darkness, not knowing where we're going. But thankfully, we have a loving God who shows us light.
this morning is worthy of the Lamb. He says, thank you for the cross, Lord. Thank you for the price you paid, bearing all my sin and shame. In love you came and gave amazing grace. He is so worthy of all our praise. thank you for fellowship, Lord. I thank you that we are able to love on one another as a family, Lord. I thank you for your light, Lord, in the darkness. I pray that I'm not walking in darkness, Lord, but I'm walking in your light. I pray that you would just bless this morning, and I pray that you would just be with Pastor John as he's speaking this morning, that you will just speak through him, Lord. I pray for everyone here to open up their hearts to listen to you, Lord. I pray that, um, just with all the sicknesses going on, Lord, I pray for um, the incident that happened this morning, Lord. I pray that you will just give them comfort, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning again. Welcome to service. We're so glad you're here. If you're a guest today, we're glad you're here today. My name is John Howell. I'm pastor here at First Rural Baptist Church. I get the great privilege to be here to stand before you to present God's word to you. 
and the challenge each one of us each and every day to live out his word. Several announcements going on. If you want to look at your bulletin, you're welcome to do so. Um, our church, again, for those who may or may not know, we have an old band that just it's just not working anymore. It's the as is. It could be a good honey blind. It could be a project you can work on, do Bible studies, or if you just need something to go shoot at. It may be great for any of those things. Uh, but until October 1st, we'll take in seal bids. Myself, Brother Gary, he's not here right now. But if you'd like to hex bid a bid on that, I- I'll tell you right now, no one's given me one yet. So you husband and wives, you guys want to argue and fuss and fight about that? Don't do it. But anyway, uh, no one's given me a bid. As far as I know, I hadn't think anyone's got one to Gary. If you want to reach outside of our church, let the other folks know, it is as is. I mean, you will literally need to get it towed away. Everybody with me? Everybody understand that? It's probably not going to drive. It's probably not going to crank. So it's available. It's about a 95, 99. Yeah, it's great. Anyway, 15 past year. Liberty Executive so- Executive Committee meeting will meet tomorrow night at 6 p.m. Several of us are a part of that. Uh, again, in a fellowship hall. We will have a men's fellowship this Tuesday at Gary Clark's house. If you need some address, something like that, let me know. I have that available. I can give that to you. We'll meet at 6. I think he's going to hang up his sign, go home by 8.30 so he can go to bed early. You know. So anyway, uh, we'll be at Gary's house. It's men's fellowship. Uh, if you're a young man, if you're a teenager, I used to bring my boy when he was about 12, 13. Him and I used to go to stuff together. Bring them too. We'll probably spend just a short amount of time in God's word. But mainly, we're just going to hang out and men being with men. It's we need that. We need that encouragement. We need that fellowship. Scripture says, as iron sharpens iron, we sharpen one another. Uh, don't forget, there's several more work days available at camp. You can help out September the 19th, 9 a.m., uh, September 28th at 8.30. Also, our Senior Adult Summit, don't forget, uh, that's in uh, Orlando, 14th through 16th. Miss Betty, Brother Donald, we got four or five so far. supposed to be going right now, five right now. If you'd like to be a part of that, you're welcome to. I usually go as a chaperone. We actually ha- also have a... Uh, a mission board meeting going on that week as well. So I'll be there as well in Orlando. So if you would, uh, don't forget about that. I did forget to put in the bulletin my fall on this. October uh, 13th is our association meeting. It's a Sunday afternoon at 3 p.m. We will meet at Piney Grove Real Baptist Church right here in Shipley at 3. It's a fellowship time. We got a guest speaker. Now, some of you don't know who I'm talking about, but some do, you'll, you'll know. Brother Randy Bryant, who has served as our state executive director for gosh i think nearly 20 years i do believe is correct is officially retiring and uh he has given his resignation and he will be speaking as our guest speaker here uh in shipley on that sunday afternoon so if you like to come out and see brother randy i probably him and my Di- miss him and miss diana both uh will probably most likely be here and then they will leave myself included right afterwards we probably won't be able to hang out a whole lot for fellowshipping afterwards but then drive to orlando for the conference the next morning uh, I have a mission board meeting that Monday morning. So if you would pray for that, uh, pray for that. Also know there will be executive, the com- executive committee for the state will be interviewing. I know at least a couple people who are interviewing for that position. Pray that God will lead us to the correct man that God wants to be executive director for the state of Florida. Uh, don't forget also our Christian Workers Conference. Our deadline is not to October, but if you'd like to be a part of that, please let me know. Paperwork's available here. Any other announcements, anything overlooked? All righty, at this time, we'll dismiss our Junior Children Church. That's our preschoolers, Junior Children Church. And we do have several new helpers. I've got that laid out there. Matter of fact, I think Miss Amanda's going to start keeping those on the bulletin each week. If you want to know ahead of time, let me know. I can get those out to our young, some of our younger teens are helping us out with that. Thank you so much. Praise the Lord. we got four right there in pre- preschooler Junior Children Church. That's exciting. Now for our Children's Church, that's first through sixth grader. You can be dismissed as well. First through sixth graders. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Praise the Lord for our young people, and thank you all working. Those who will step up and work, thank you so very much. Uh, our church is not a one-man show. I, I think you know that. Uh, if you've been around here long enough, you understand that. We all do something somewhere. And we are talking about gifts. We are talking about serving. We are talking about, in the book of Romans, chapter 12, about authentic love. That's what we hit last week. Uh, point one was authentic love. If you remember last week, we talked about authentic love in such a way that we must comfort and confront our brothers and sisters in Christ in love with the Word of God. And I want to read that again because we all need that. Listen, there is no one perfect, no, not one. We're all going to, hey, sometimes we veer off the road, amen? You ever been a... Who in here will be honest, I want hands raised now in church. 
Who in here will be honest, if you have ever driven a vehicle, that you'll be honest, there's a moment or two in your vehicle driving experience that you've been distracted and got off course. As followers of Jesus Christ, I'm here to tell you that the devil at times want us to get distracted. Here's one for you, and this is not part of my sermon, but man, Lord, okay, I'm just going to go with it. There's times there's good things that may distract us from the main thing, from the best thing. I want to say that again. Sometimes there's good things that may distract us, and we may get off course. I can't tell you in times my wife says, you don't have to look at me when you're talking to me when you're driving. Some of you are laughing because your wife or husband has said the same thing to you. I still remember traveling for Welch College back in the day, and I won't say who he was, but we had a driver. Uh, matter of fact, wait a minute. Yeah. He was a single man who worked at the school, and he would travel sometimes. He was older than most of our students, and he would travel sometimes. And, and I promise you, he was the best man I've ever seen to be able to talk to a lady beside him who was also single, because every once in a while we have guys and girls traveling. And he could drive and talk to her, almost never looking at the road. But some of you are like, how am I alive? God's grace, okay? But the reality is, if we're not careful, something even good or beautiful can be distracting. And we may get off course. And we, Galatians chapter 6, we who are spiritual, who is that? Every Christian in the room. Must then go to that brother or that sister. Comfort them and or confront them in Christ, in love, with the word of God. And as I ended last week, those of us who may get off a course a little bit, what did I say? Anybody remember the last few words I said? Just two words. Started with an R. Receive it. Everybody with me? You see, none of us, <laughs> some of us really don't like to be corrected. Do I hear, oh me, I mean, amen. I don't like you to tell me what I'm doing wrong. And some of us got a gift of pointing out somebody else's sin. <laughs> or them doing wrong. I, I mean, we really do. And I'll be honest with you, for some people, it drives me crazy. But someone who loves me enough, and here we go, guys, and respects me enough to say, Hey, John, I love you. Your zipper's down. Especially, it'll tell me out in the hallway, not in front of everybody, to embarrass me. You hear the respect what I'm talking about, guys? Hey, sweetheart, come here. You got toilet paper dragging from you? Shoo. Let me get that for you. Now, I'm kind of having fun about that. I'm kind of being light. I'll use my name. Hey, John, man, I saw your frustration in your eyes when you talked to your wife yesterday. Why don't you and I have lunch tomorrow? We're, we need to talk. I'll use my name. John, I saw you take a double look and a triple look and a fifth and sixth look at that young waitress as she walked by. I saw your daughter look at you, John, and she saw what you did as well. You and I need to have a conversation. That, my friend, is loving them authentically to bring comfort or confront with love with the word of God, with in Christ, in love, with truth, okay? Speak the truth in love. Why? Because here's a fact. The devil wants to destroy your home. The devil wants to destroy your life. The devil wants to destroy your children. Here's one, in case you don't know this, the devil wants to destroy your local church. And he'll probably attack your pastor and your leaders above those who just sit in a pew. And no offense, I'm not trying to be, hey, listen, we need people sitting in a pew. Because if you're a guest and there's three people here, and you're coming in with three or four, you're like, hey, nobody here. There's, some, there's actually a good thing about someone sitting in a pew. It's actually good. At the same time, we need people who sit in a pew who's going to pray for the pastor. Lord, bless him right now. Lord, help him to say what needs to be said. Lord, help me to receive what he wants me to hear. Or better yet, Lord, help me to receive what you want me to hear. Does this make sense? All right, let's go on. Point two is starting today. Authentic love shows itself in service. Authentic love shows itself 
and service. Now, I have three point, sub-points to this. The first one is enthusiastically. Enthusiastically. Let's look at Romans chapter 12, verse 11. Before we do, let's pray. Father, I need you to help my mind to concentrate and say the things that you want me to say. Lord, I know I have prepared, but I feel like even at this last few moments, you've kind of led me a different way. And Lord, I want to be obedient to your leading. Father, I pray for each person in the sound of my voice. If there's someone here that doesn't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, I pray today will be the day they repent of their sin. They put their trust in you by faith. Father, if there's Christians here today, Lord, who are in struggling, truly loving, authentically, their brothers and sisters in the Lord. And maybe they've been struggling to even serve with authentic love. I pray, Lord, help us today to receive what you have for us. Help us to learn. Help us to grow. And Lord, if you would, even stretch us to do what you want us to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Romans chapter 12, verse 11. This is probably every parent's favorite verse in the Bible to their teenage children. Never be lazy! Work hard! And serve the Lord enthusiastically. I didn't hear a single amen. I could have swore I got at least 15. I, I'm kind of kidding around a little bit. You guys know what I'm talking about? I, I'm going to pick a little bit. My generation and younger, gosh, I really, I'm not that young anymore. But anyway, those who are a little younger than my generation has got a lot of negativity against them. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Some of you guys are in here, millennial, Gen Zs. I'm a Gen Xer myself, or Buster, for those who know what the Busters are. Busters were born right after the Boomers, or the Boomers came home. Well, the Builders came home from World War II, started having families after World War II. That was the Boomers. That was my dad. He was born in 46, okay, because the war, World War II ended in what year? 45, 46 starts the Boomers huge generation. Boomers got married. They had the Busters, or Generation X. Some of us call us the Xers. Then it goes on from there. The X, the Y. Some of, we have several Generation Ys in here. That starts around 77 to about 86. Right, uh, uh, 70. Some say Generation X is also 77. I've seen one or two say Generation Y. But anyway, you got the X, the Ys, you got the Millennials, you got the Zs. And unfortunately, the millennials and the Z's have been called all kinds of names. Now, ultimately, hear my voice. If you really struggle with generation millennials and generation Z's, it's us, the Buster's fault. Because of the way we raised them. Helicopter parent? You guys know what I'm talking about? Oh, come on. Helicopter parent is someone who goes back and forth. Fixing everything for their kids. How many times your mom and dad, okay, if you're my age or older, if you're a child of the 80s, how many times your mom and daddy come and brought you lunch at school because you forgot something? One. My parents picked me up. Actually, it wasn't even my parents. My dad's first cousin picked me up when I was a child in about second grade and took me to my grandmother's house because I had chicken pox. Mom and dad would work it. Something Gary said a couple weeks ago, he learned from his daddy, you go to work. Sick or not, you go to work. I mean, I remember having migraines as a kid. I could barely get them to take me to the doctor. I wasn't sick enough to go to the doctor. Hello? If I had a high fever, go to school. Unless I was throwing up and hugging a toilet, you went to school. Hello? You go to work. The younger generation had been taught that because we, as parents, didn't do a great job with that. Now, let me pick on us just a little bit. I could be lazy when I want to. Hello? You know what I did? You know what my wife and I did yesterday? First time we did it together in a long time. We took a day off. I mean, we got everything done on Friday so we could just rest on Saturday. We watched almost a three-hour movie together yesterday. It's crazy. Based on a real event. Now, why am I saying that? Some of us never stop working. And that's not good either. 
But some of us have been beat up too much about not being lazy. I mean, being too lazy. Well, let me tell you what Paul told the church of Rome. When was this written? First century. Never be lazy. So this is nothing new, folks. I would almost guarantee the boomer, the builders and boomers probably said the same thing about us Xers. You're lazy. You need to go work. I can't tell you how many times my dad looked at me. You got a job yet? How much money have you been saving? What are you going to do for a living? You guys ever did it parent and kids? I'm telling you, I was only in fourth grade, but he wanted to know what I was going to do for a living. I'm kidding. I am kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Oh, never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. So what does this look like? I kept thinking, what would this go, what would, what would be in a great example biblically? And I was reading out different commentaries. One pointed this out. I'm like, oh my gosh, why did I think about this? So what does it look like to never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically? There is a man in scripture. His name for a while meant the deceiver. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Say it again. Real loud. Jacob. Good job. I thought I heard it over here. Jacob. His name literally meant deceiver. He deceived his daddy. He deceived his brother and his older brother. And he was his mama's favorite. He was a mama's boy. He was the inside kind of guy. His daddy was a daddy's daddy. His older brother was a favorite. He was a daddy's boy. He was the outside wood and deer hunter and all kinds of other hunter stuff, you know. But he goes away and he goes live with one of his cousins because his older brother's going to kill him. His mom said, hey, your brother's going to kill you. Go and live with my family. Go somewhere else. Don't die. And he goes and he falls in love with one of his distant relatives. That's kind of weird today. Man. It's a whole different generation. But he loved her and he worked out a deal. He had no money. So he asked her father, can I marry your daughter? Well, he's like, you got to pay for her. And some of you think, that's crazy. Well, things are a little different today. <laughs> Matter of fact, usually it's the daddy's, the daddy family of the bride that pays for all the wedding stuff, not the husbands. But back then, knowing that I have three daughters, I think I like the idea. Maybe you grooms should pay me. Oh, I like this. Uh, we should go back to Old Testament on this one. Anybody else have some daughters? You know what I'm talking about? I'm having a little fun here. Come on. I'm having fun. I'm having fun. But he said, I'll work seven years for Rachel. Let me read you what the scripture said. This is Genesis chapter 29, 20. I don't have it up there. I apologize. Genesis 29, 20. Listen carefully. So Jacob worked seven years to pay for Rachel. But his love for her was so strong that it seemed to him but a few days. Must have been love, right? Guys, I've been here a little over seven years now. Now, here's the truth. Overall, it seems like we just got here. It hadn't been that long. Now, some of you actually voted on me. A lot of you did not. Matter of fact, the vast majority of our church today did not vote on me. I won't take the numbers, but I'm just guessing. Many of you were not here, which is cool. That's exciting. That means we've got some growth. Now, yes, some of it's transfer, but at the same time, we got some growth, which is really exciting. But I can understand it just seemed like a few days. So how do we apply this? Guys, when we're having true authentic love and we're serving one another, we do it in service. We're not lazy about it. We work hard and we th do it enthusiastically to the point it doesn't even seem like we're working. Uh, the old saying was, find a job you love, you'll never work a day in your life. Our love for the Lord should move us to serve others with enthusiasm. Everybody with me? All right, let's go on. Point two, uh, point B. Rejoice patient prayer. Authentic love says we should serve one another. Do it with rejoice. Be patient about it at times in prayer. Listen to what the scripture says, Romans 12, 12. Rejoice in our confident hope. Hope of what? Hope of salvation. Hope for eternity with Jesus. Be patient in what? Trouble. If you had any kind of trouble the last seven years, raise your hand. Everybody in the room should raise your hand. If you had trouble this week, raise your hand. You know, who had a car light go off and it's like, oh no. What now? I mean, we had air conditioning replaced this week. <whistles> right? Here at church. You know? 
things happen. Troubles come. Be patient when trouble comes. Now, if you notice, there's a comma there. The sentence isn't complete. Rejoice in our confident hope. Period. Watch this. Be patient, comma, pause, and keep praying. Sometimes we need to pray when we're having troubles. Now, some of you are like me. You'd rather go fix that problem immediately. If you're a man, I think we're just kind of wired that way. Your wife wants to talk and just share some things with you. And we want them to be quiet so that we can fix their problem. Guys, sometimes we just need to be quiet and let them talk. They'll fix their own problem. They just need to talk it out. They just need you to listen. Now, some of you have no clue what I'm talking about. But my guess is that's a lot of people in the room. Guys and gals, that is. Unless you're like me. Window set and be quiet. I'll talk, 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 talk. And she's kind of looking at me. She's like, I just need some quiet time. I'm like, okay. Man, I'm an extrovert even at home. When you're an introvert and you're married to an extrovert, you never get along from people. I mean, you ladies, some, some of you new moms, you're going to get this. There's going to be a day you're just going to go to the bathroom and shut the door. Because that's about the only place you can go and get away. I'm married to her. I go in there too. <laughs> Woo! I'm having a little fun there. But you guys know what I'm talking about? There's days you can't even get away from me. I want to talk to her. Now, I'm kidding a little bit. But guys, listen. We all at times go through troubles. Jesus said, in this world, in this life, you will have troubles and trials. It's not if. You will have them. I'll say it again. It's not if. We will have them. Be patient. Keep praying. Now, if you also remember, we don't have time going through it, but if you remember, sometimes God allows us, sometimes God allows us to go through these troubles and trials because it's a test. We just talked about that in Sunday school this morning. He's not tempting us. He's giving us a test. Keep praying. The old saying goes, he seems like he's so far away. Every time I'm going through a test or troubles or trials, I'm trying to keep my faith. I keep praying. I'm working hard, but he's not talking back to me. The old saying is, little meme, your teachers don't talk to you during your test either. Sometimes as adults, once we get out of college or out of high school or junior high, we feel like all the tests are over, right? I've learned all I need to learn. I've, I've done everything I need to do, right? I'm going to pick at you a little bit. When's the last time you read a good book just to help you grow? What? Read a book? I mean, I hadn't been in 12th grade for a long time, and I read the Cliff Notes back then. Some of you old, young people don't know about that. It, that those like Sparks Notes. Us old folks don't know what Sparks are, but it's Cliff Notes. Do you know Great Gatsby has a cartoon? That's what I watched in school. Sorry, no offense. I was just I was lazy. Oh, sorry, I worked you smarter, not harder. <laughs> I watched it. I'm more of an audio learner anyway, more than reading. Anybody else? Some of you don't know. Some of you, okay. Reading was my, not my forte. I still struggle at times. Okay. But we need to keep praying, guys. We're going to have troubles. We're going to have trials. Don't give up. It may just be a test. And that test allows us to know either you fail it or you pass it. Now, here's what we should do in school. If they don't know how to do it, we should probably keep mastering it until we do. That means I'm going to be 28, still a junior in high school. Not necessarily, but there's an idea. Maybe we should master it before we just move you on. Well, we don't have time. When we get 180 hours, you've got to finish school. 180 days, sorry. But maybe I need to spend more time on that at home. And guys, sometimes God does this. He allows us to spend a little bit more time on that subject. And I've said it before like this. The lesson will continue to the lessons learned. Let's say it again. Hey, John, this is God speaking. The lesson will continue to the lessons learned. Now pay attention. Hello? Who in here has gotten a whooping a few times from God from the same thing you did three years ago? Time to change. I mean, really repent. If we're still getting God spanked, from something we did two, three, four, five years ago, we really didn't repent. Repent says, I'm going the wrong way. I'm not doing that anymore. That's repent. Everybody with me? 
You guys hear me? You know what I'm saying? That's repenting. I'm going the wrong way. Woo! Lord, I'm sorry. I have messed up. I've, I've, I've totally made a mess. I feel guilt. I feel shame. I know better. Lord, help me. I'm done with that. That's repentance. You fall back here once in a while? Sure. Hopefully you've got some good godly men, men, some good godly ladies, lady coming around you. You don't fall back into it enough when you've got people helping you up and helping you away. Listen closely what Paul told the church of Corinth, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16. He said, that is why we never give up. Though our bodies are dying, our spirits are being renewed every day. For our present troubles are small and won't last very long. But pastor, you don't understand, I got big troubles. Imagine if you would, I'm actually about nine foot tall, not standing on a platform. Imagine if you would, you're about 14, 15 years old and you're five foot four. My name's Goliath, you're David. How big do I look? Pretty big. You see, guys, so many times we're like little bitty David when we're looking at our big old problems. We need to get our eyes off the problem and get our eyes on God because God, compared to Goliath, is an ant. Hello? We had ants in our packages this week. We got so much rain, ants were going everywhere they weren't supposed to go. So they got into our mail collecting area and got into our mail. We picked up the mail. We put it in our car because who wants to walk out there where you can drive? Right? Walking, working smaller, we're driving by it, you know. Hey, I used to have a deacon. He lived to be 100 years old. At 92, he would walk out on his porch, get on his four-wheeler and crank that baby up and ride it to the mailbox. Go look at the cows. It's like, man, I hope I can ride a four-wheeler when I'm 92 years old. He said, I can't get around. It's about the only way I can. <laughs> you know? He was kind of quiet, but that was pretty neat. That was a cool, cool reason for a four-wheeler. He lived in farm country. He was a, I said, oh, poor dark, dirt farmer. He said, how about just a dirt farmer? I don't know if I was a poor dirt farmer. I was a dirt farmer. I'm like, okay. You know. Knew God well. Him and his wife were amazing people. Loved him to death. Now, why I say that? In his 90s, or in his 70s, they would still go around to a nursing home and sing and play music for everybody in the nursing home. In his 70s. I want to pick up some of our old folks real quick. Don't quit working. I mean, I know sometimes physically we can't do what we used to do, but you can pray. Your, your, job, your job may change, but your ministry doesn't. You might just pray more. You may not be on your knees playing with the kids. You may be praying more. You may be writing letters for encouragement. Some of you guys know how to text. <laughs> it's funny. But anyway, <laughs> and you try to text, and you make phone calls, and you encourage one another. Folks, all these problems we go through, they're real little when it comes compared to the eternity and hope we have in Jesus Christ. He says, for our present trouble are small, won't last very long. Quit looking at your big Goliath problem. Look at how big God is compared to that little bitty Goliath. Everybody with me? All right. Yet, they produce for us glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. So we don't look at the troubles we can see now. Don't look at Goliath. Rather, we fix our gaze on things that cannot be seen. For the things we see now will soon be gone. But the things we cannot see will last forever. I can't see God, but I can see the effects of God in this world, in my life, in my home, in my family. I love that. And there's times we focus too much on our troubles and our problems. Let's focus on God. Point three, uh, point C. When Alexander started turning about 12 or 13, this is a word... A set of words I said to him a lot. And I said that all the way through college. So you men listen to me. Young men listen to me. There's going to be a day when your daddy is going to need to have a conversation with you. And if your daddy don't do it, then look for a good, cop, godly Christian man to look at you and say, step up. I almost added this one, show up. There's a moment in time you need to step up. Less video gaming, less playing, step up 
and becoming what God wants you to become is a godly man. And every woman in the room should say amen. There's a generation of young ladies who are not being pursued because their, bo- their future husbands are still boys at 26, 28, and 32 living at mom's house playing video games. I almost want to say nursing on moms and still playing video games. And if you think I'm kidding, look at this generation. Now, you're beating up on a generation. I try not to. I actually try to mentor and educate and help lift them up by telling them to step up. And yes, I I say this again. I didn't have this conversation once with Alexander. It was an ongoing conversation from about 12. Well, he just turned 23. I think last time I told him that was probably... Well, he was in college still. So about 12 to 21, 20. I was there, you got to keep stepping up. you got to keep stepping up. You see, guys, Adam in his perfect state was passive. When his wife was being tempted, he was, in his passivity, did nothing to stop the old serpent. In his passivity, he, uh, no offense ladies, he allowed her to lead. That's before he even sinned, people. Guys, I love you. I are one. We have a lot that we're going to be answering for because how we have and have not led our family. Amen. I'm scared of it too, so I try to do better every day. There was a couple nights ago I went by, I'm like, Dadgum, I forgot to do a devotion with the family. Ugh! Anybody know what I'm talking about? There's days I'll just turn on my little computer and let it go and say, hey, let's talk about it. Have the guy, gal, do a little devotion and go on. There was a while, and guys, every kid in this church, except the littlest ones, all have devotional magazines that we as a church purchase, and they get it for Sunday school. And there's devotionals for every age in there. And I want to challenge you. Check them out. They're good stuff. For your teens, low teens, there's some great funny stuff in there. It's pretty hilarious, actually. You know, check it out. It'll remind you every day to do that devotion together at their age and yours as well. But guys, there's moments we've got to step up. Ladies, ladies, you are put on so much. Today's world teaches our worldly culture, tells our little boys to be little boys who are 28 or 30 or 40 and tells little ladies, little girls to be adults when you're 12. That is the junk that our world is pushing. That's wrong, folks. And if you don't understand that, I love you. You're missing out. Listen, you're... Th- <gasps> I'm going to pick on one thing. and I'm not against it. It's just not for me. Tattoos. I'm going to pick at it for just a moment. Lots of you have tattoos. I love you. I'm not judging you. Are you hearing me? Please say yes or no. I love you. But here's my point. A 12, 13, 14, 15-year-old doesn't need to put something on her body that's going to be there forever. I'm sorry if you do that with your kids. I disagree. And I'm seeing teenagers in this community. Do you know what stupid things I was doing at 13, 14, and 15 that I'm thankful I don't still have that on me? I did some stupid, sinful things. Yes, I have some scars from that. But here, have you ever, has anybody ever regret a decision you made at 13? 14? I can tell you the girls I regret going after at that age. I can tell you the people I regret hanging out with at that age. Because I allowed them to influence me in a very sinful way. And I knew better. But we let them make decisions that will probably be on their bodies or connected to their bodies for the rest of their life. My daughter's in psychology, and I don't quite get all this. But if I understand correctly, at 25, at this point of the brain, ladies, your brain finally gets matured and actually developed. For us guys, it's here, about 25. Maybe we shouldn't make any major decisions until we're a little bit older. Just saying. Again, I'm not picking. You're going to raise your family the way you're going to raise it. We can agree and disagree, okay? I think it's just too young. I think it's too young. I think it's too young. But that's your opinion. It is. 
It is my peace. Let me move on. We're going to finish this up soon. 12, 13. And guys, listen, there's a lot worse things out there than tattoos. Some of, you, some of you guys give your kids one of these, and you have no clue what they're looking at. Do yourself and your child a loving favor. Pick this up, look at the history, and make some choices. Well, I don't know their password. I love you, but you're not being very smart as a parent. I told my kids, older two, when we went off to college, if you want me to help you in college, I will have access to all your grades and your attendance and what you're doing and everything. To this day, I can still log on. Miranda and Alexander have called a Popoli account. I can still pull up all the grades for the last four years. I don't think you guys can get that. You, you can still get in there, right? I looked at Alexander's about a year ago. That password still works. They ain't been in school for two years. Four for her. If you want my help, I'm still your parent. Hey, you guys hear me? If they still live at home, if you're still helping them financially, kids, listen to me. You still live at home and your parents taking care of over 50% of your income and your expenses? According to the law of the land, they claim you as a dependent. You're still a child. Well, I'm 22 years old. I don't care. If you're not providing for yourself, you're not actually an adult. According to, according to our laws, you may be 18. Okay, I have harped on that too much. Romans 12, 13. When God's people are in need. Now, in the Greek, that word need is actually plural. So it basically would say when God's people have needs. In the Greek, that's plural. When God's people are in need or have needs, be ready to help them. Always be eager to practice hospitality. Folks, how many needs do you have? Your deepest need is Jesus. That's everyone on the planet, period. We need oxygen. I probably need healthier food, but food. Shelter will be nice. No offense, thank God for clothing. You know what I'm saying? Whew. You would mm, thank the Lord for clothing. You know, those are our basic. The for sure thing we need is Jesus. But I want to run through this. There are times as our Christian family have many needs. I want to run through a list, see if they identified any of you at any time. Last, let's say last 12 months. Material needs, financial needs, emotional needs. How about this one? A need for someone to understand. You know, when I pastored in my 20s, I, I became a head lead pastor at 25. My associate was 63. He was part-time. Actually, he was a volunteer position. And there was people who would say something about the thing called a sciatic nerve. Now listen, I grew up because my mama told me, you're about to get on my last nerve. I just assumed that's what they were talking about. It wasn't until... 13 years later, 3,000 miles away, I felt something called sciatic pain, sciatica. At that moment, that little 25-year-old young preacher understood. I'm not saying we have to go through what everybody goes through, but sometimes we just need somebody to understand. I haven't walked through everything you walked through. And you haven't walked through everything I have walked through. But I can just give you some love and compassion and say, I don't go what you're going through. But man, sometimes you just need to be there and just love on them. One of the best things Job's friends did for seven days, they sat there and talked, excuse me, they sat there with him and just mourned with him and kept their mouth shut. What a glorious seven days Job had. Sometimes we have a need for sympathy. Sometimes there's need for spiritual attention. Sometimes there are needs for encouragement. 
and one we don't talk a lot about in most churches today, sometimes there are needs for spiritual discipline. Honestly, guys, our needs are endless. And we must respond with compassion. So what does Scripture say? 1 John 3, 17, I don't have it up there. You can write it down. 1 John 3, 17, Scripture says, If someone has enough money to live well and sees a brother or sister in need, but shows no compassion, how can God's love be in that person? Guys, practice hospitality. We have to understand there was no Holiday Inn back in those days. Hello? There was no Motel 6. Used to be six dollars a night, Motel Six, Motel Eight, eight dollars a night. That's where Motel Six got the name from. They used to only charge six dollars. Holiday Inn, if I remember the story right, actually got started because him and his family was traveling across the country, and there was no great places to travel and stay for a family. So he wanted to create something that was a little nicer and neater, and could be kind of the same no matter where you stop. How many of you guys ever stayed in one of those back in the 60s, 70s, 80s? I mean, you stayed in a hotel that you today you wouldn't go to. Anybody know what I'm talking about? How many of you guys don't know what I'm talking about? You've always stayed in nice hotels. I love our kids. Our, we have spoiled the snot out of our children. Who said that? Proverbs 3, 27, do not withhold good from those who deserve it when it's in your power to help them. Do you remember what, I think it was Peter, I think it was Peter or John, if my memory serves me right. He said, silver and gold we don't have, but in the name of Jesus, get up and walk. You, you may not have anything you can share. We can all share a smile. We can all sm- share encouraging words. We can pray for one another. We can say, I, I missed you Sunday. When am I going to see you again? Now, I love you guys. And every once in a while, you'll hear from me. I missed you. I hadn't seen you in a week or two. I promise, I'm not trying to give you a guilt trip. I'm just checking on you. So, so you never checked on me because you're here most of the time. Cool. Proverbs 3.28, if you can help your neighbor now, don't say, come back tomorrow and I'll help you out then. Proverbs, so that was our ending. I want to, I want to present something to our church. It was kind of presented already, and I feel like we can still do it. So I want to add a little bit more to it today. Authentic love. Many of you met the Duncans just a couple of weeks. Well, by July, the Duncans came in July. They have been here before. They are truly personal friends of Wendy and our family. Uh, we, I have known them for over 15, 16 years, and I love them to death. They're authentic. They're great. Uh, she is a nurse practitioner. Uh, she has, again, more education in the medical field than most doctors in the country of Ecuador. He is, by trade, a police officer, police academy trainer, actually. He taught police force academies at the University of Mizzou. Uh, he has... He study he for those I wish you guys I wish you would just have a little fun with us. Um, he knows Krav Maga pretty good. Anybody know what I'm talking about? That's Israeli's hand to hand combat. He knows it well. You want to be around him if there's something goes bad. You know what I'm saying? But he's also he was a volunteer youth pastor in time, became a licensed and ordained and part of a, a church plant, and uh, they foster several children over years and. They've had two of their own, and God just led them. He's been a business owner. He, he, he did consulting around the nation, uh, teaching people how to be safe in their communities when bad things happen. Some of our schools will practice drills. I'm glad our small town does that kind of stuff. We, we need to do that, unfortunately. We live in that kind of a sinful time. But they felt God's calling to go to Ecuador and to minister. And if you remember when he was here, he says, We can't just go and visit these people. We have to be invited in. And there, she literally goes out in the bush area. You guys know what I'm talking about? Um, Cannibal, airplane, what's his name? Missionary. Jim Elliott. 
they are literally not too far where Jim Elliott, back in the 50s, was killed and cannibalized. That's where they are. Okay, he was a missionary. That's the area they're going to. They can't just show up. They have to be invited. Well, they've been, they've been doing some really great stuff. So they have a plan. I'm going to call it Project H2O. Okay? There's a plan, and it's multiple phases. Phase one, okay, okay the, the town, sorry, let me, the town, Awatino is the community. We'll call it a town. It's approximately 280 people. It has a very small church, around 20 people. That's where the Duncans are partnering with this one little town. They're able to get in for the medical side, and now they're getting a little deeper in there to try to help this little community of 280 people. Anybody notice the size of the church? Who thinks that's tiny? 20 or so people. Who just, that's tiny. All right, let me give you a little, let me talk to you about percentages. If there was only 280 people in this little town of Chipley, and we had around 20, that's about how many percent? Close to 10%. That's a pretty good sized church. That would be like, you know, a town of 4,000 and they run four or 500. Hello? All right. So they're partnering with this little town, okay? Phase one develop and locate digging and building retaining walls and roofing. They have actually found already five springs in this little community. Cool, right? All right, let's keep going. Thank you, Mark. This is one of the springs they found and they have dug out. You see the pipes? That looks like something I would rig up at my house, right? And of course, I don't have the code. I, I would probably not be doing the codes correctly, but that's something there. Next slide. They have now built retaining walls. Okay, see the retaining wall? One of the workers there. Next slide. It's literally holding water. Who would like to drink from that right there? Spring water. I have two or three of you raise your hand. Hey, something's better than nothing, amen? Let's go on. Now, this is pretty cool. This is actually a picture of another community, but they're going to build one of these. This is going to be their fellowship hall for their little church that holds 20, an outdoor meeting area. They're going to build one of these. This is part of the next phase, phase two, okay? One more picture. Thank you, sir. This is... What the storage container looks like at a different community, Bella Vista Alta. This is where they've already did one of these. So this is what they want to do in phase two. And they're asking for our help on phase two. Phase one is actually already completed. They've already did all that. They found five springs. They have dug them out. They have put up retainer walls. And they, they're holding water. Phase two, they need help with. Water delivery, on-site storage, that big blue tank, that's one of probably five they will need. Round numbers, this is what we're looking at, about $650 for a pump. $2,500 for storage tanks, about five times five, about $500 a piece. Okay, next slide, thank you Mark. $2,500 for pumping supplies, the pipe, uh, plumbing supplies, the pipes, the fittings, the valve. Around $300 for electrical supplies, you got to love this, and $50 for chlorine to shock the storage tank before they actually use it. So that adds up to you mathematicians around $6,000. Now, if I remember correctly, talking to Miss Stacy, she's our treasurer, we took up an offering with our VBS, and that one day we took up around $1,700. Here's my challenge to our church. I just had to redo some plumbing. Our well needed to work at my house. Brother Thomas helped us out. Got us connected to a plumber who could work on it. Brother Thomas helped us out. Between that and a filtering system, we spent about 4800 for a family of, well, now four. What if we could spend <clears throat> 6000 and help 280 people or so get water? Clean water. Spring water. I feel like as our church, we're small. This is not taking from our tithes and offering. We just had to replace seven, eight thousand dollars air conditioning. Hey, praise the Lord, the old one went 19 years. If you don't understand, that's really good. If we can get another 19 years out of this one, woo, 
Ooh, that was a good investment. I mean, oh, hallelujah, you know. But guys, we're talking $6,000. There's some of us in this room or in our church spent a lot more than that in our own personal wells, and it feeds our family. I feel like we could do this. Now, this is my hope for us, that for the next six, I, I want to do less than six, 12 months, because your goal is to get this completed in 25. But we don't need to take all of 25 to get the funds ready, because they won't be able to complete it. They'll need the funds before the end of 25. So I would love to spend the next five or six months setting aside above and beyond our tithes and offering to help make this happen. So that 280 people, approximately, can get water. And here's a great thing. Do you understand how this works? She can go in with the medical side. He's going in with the water. Now that water is spring. It's natural. But that water has contaminants in it. And that water needs some cleaning. Well, you can use that illustration to talk about well, us humans, we're natural. We have contaminants in us. It's called sin. And it needs a good filtering system that cleans us. That filtering system is named Jesus Christ. Hello? He's the living water. What a concept. I mean, isn't this wonderful? They're providing a physical need. And if you divide and touch on their physical needs, they're more apt to listen to the deepest need about Jesus. The living water. So here's my challenge for us, church, and I need to hear from you, and it may be one or two, you shake your head, you may say, yeah, let's do this. I don't want one person, hey, if you want to write a check, cool, do it. Do what God lays in your heart. But over the next several months, I think we could raise this above and beyond. You know, you know what I'm saying? I, I think we can do this. We're, we're not that small. That's not a big, yeah, that's a big number, but with all of us working together, that's not bad. I mean, that's not bad at all. I mean, we're not 100 in here. Let's say we're 50 in here. I'm estimating. I know we got kids in here, but hey, kids can work. Every mom and daddy should have said amen. <laughs> kids can work and do chores. Amen. I remind my kids every once in a while, this is not a country club. We all work in this house. Howell, you're going to work. <laughs> now clean your room. I want to walk in here tomorrow. You know? Actually, I want to walk in here today. Actually, I don't want to walk in here at all. Just keep it clean. Hello? Come on. I'm having fun now. You know I'm talking about Miranda because she's sitting right here. She has her own place. I don't look at her bedroom at all. But anyway, authentic love, serving others. There's a need. I feel like our church can meet that $6,000 need. We've already got about 1700 We can do the rest. What does that look like? I don't know. Let's see if I, see if I can do math. If six people did 1000 each, no. If 12 people did 500 each, no. If 24 people did 250 each, uh, 24 and 20. If 48 people did 125 each, there's probably 48 or 50 people up here. I, I mean, okay, 125 divided by, let's say, 5. That's easier on my math. That's 6 months. So 125 divided by 6. How much is that? $30? 50 Five times five, 20. Why don't I have my calculator out? In, country, in the county schools, you couldn't use your calculator. But in the city schools, they could. 125 divided by six. That's $20 a month. Divided by four weeks. Don't buy coffee for one week, one time a week, for $5.20. And donate that coffee money or your energy drink or your going out money to the project H2O, put your checks H2O, okay, credit cards H2O, envelopes H2O, I, I think we could do that, I, I mean, my girls are, well, youngest is about to turn 15, but she can earn five hours a week, you know what I'm saying, I mean, she may come to you and say, hey, can I come babysit, <laughs> don't let her do it for free, because <laughs> she's got somebody she needs to bless. So guys, here's my hope, is that we as a church can show authentic love to people we never met before in Ecuador so that they can have some clean water and they can hopefully hear the message of Jesus Christ. And one day we'll get to see them in glory one day and say, hey, I prayed for you, I helped support you, all praise to Jesus. Not praise to me, all praise to Jesus. Let's pray. Father, Lord, as we pray, Lord, we thank you for your grace and mercy. We thank you so much for men and women, even in their 30s and 40s, answering the call to the mission field. Hallelujah that you're still calling men and women. 
hallelujah for the men and women who will answer the call and say, yes, Jesus, whatever you want me to do, wherever you want me to go, I am yours. I'm going to show love. I'm going to show authentic love. I'm going to love you, Jesus. I'm going to serve your body. I'm going to serve your church. Lord, I'm going to serve those who don't even know you. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray a blessing over the Duncans, the families they're working with. I pray, God, that souls will be saved and lives be changed. Lord, for every person in this room who said, I want to help, I, I want to, I'm going to raise some money, I, I want to do some yard work for the kids, I, I want to earn some, I want to give to help out here. Lord, help us to do this. But Lord, help us not to just look at the money side. Lord, help us remember to pray for the people who's going to receive the water, that they can receive the living water of Jesus Christ. Father, I pray a blessing over our church family. Lord, I think of Miss Evelyn right now. I pray God just bless her. I pray, Lord, you'll bless our time together. As, as we continue to look into your word uh, in the book of Romans on Sunday morning, on Wednesday nights, our youth groups, our adults, Lord, we ask that you will be glorified. We ask that we will have a craving to know you and to make you known. And we ask this in the prayerful, we ask this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you folks. Let me see if I got any updates. I don't think I have yet.